Hey, how's everybody doing today? Today we're going to go over programming the Corsair Utility Engine for the Scimitar Pro RGB. In this guide, we're going to go over profiles and adding a profile, associating a profile to a program, sharing uh, examples of importing and exporting. Um, we're going to talk about the share custom profile function that's built into the program, which isn't necessarily useful for the Scimitar Pro, but it is a pretty nice addition to the software. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the hardware software profile difference, why you would pick one over the other. Uh, and then we're going to go over the actions. Right? Uh, I'm going to give you the, the basic flow of remapping or creating, changing any button. Um, I'm going to talk about how to create a function and how to apply that function to a button. Uh, I'm briefly going to go over the lighting of the of the mouse because um, it's not really all that important as far as functionality is considered, but it's a cool little addition, so I'll throw it in there. Uh, I'm going to talk about the DPI, um, the purpose of it, why we would use it or change it or not change it, uh, and how to use it. Um, I'm not going to be going over performance because it's not anything that I've actually found reuseful in any kind of facet yet. So. Um, I mean, if you find a use for it, that's awesome. Leave a comment or something. Tell me I'm a moron. I don't really care. Um, and if you can show me something that is useful, then great. Otherwise, it's not useful. And then the last thing I'm going to go over is the surface calibration. Um, once again, the default for a lot of this stuff is pretty good. Uh, but, you know, having the option to calibrate for different surfaces, depending on what type of situation that you're in, is useful. Right, so we'll go over it. All right, so let's get right to it. So first thing, <coughs> this is the CUE, the Corsair Utility Engine, and in here you're going to do all your programming for any type of Corsair, any peripheral that they have, uh, that is programmable. So we have a couple different uh, menu options over here. We have profiles, actions, lighting effects, DPI. Uh, performance and surface calibration. So we're going to start off with profiles. Now the first thing I'd like for you to re recognize here with a profile is um, when you add a profile you get this option right here software hardware and Corsair is really nice about giving you tool tips about what a lot of these things do um, so if you don't understand something, uh, just put the cursor over it, and most of the time there's some kind of information that pops up about it. Right? So, but what this all comes down to is you have two different types of ways of saving the information. One is a software profile, which is um, you're going to store all the profile information on the computer that is connected to the device, and it's going to get all its information on how it's going to do things, react, keybinds, lighting, all that kind of stuff in the software of, of the computer right? and there's a hardware profile which is when you actually take the information that you have for the remapping or functions of these things and you're gonna upload it to the mouse and now you can take that mouse and plug it into any device and it's gonna do what you programmed it to do not what the way that the excuse me computer that you plugged into thinks that it should do right so the hardware profile is really limited. Um, there's, you know, you can only do certain things with it until you one run out of space, or two, where the computer just doesn't understand the commands that are coming from it. So it's just not going to do the right thing, right? So the safest way to do it is if you're always going to be plugging in your mouse to the computer uh, and always have the utility engine running, then you're going to want to do it as a software profile. If you're trying to build it so where it's a generic. Uh, profile that goes with the mouse, then you're going to want to do a hardware profile. Right? Um, now a couple op options that we have as far as a profile is considered is one, you can link this profile that you're creating to a program. Game, Internet Explorer, I don't know, anything, right? Microsoft products, whatever. Anything in there, you can just click into it and then it, you go to um, C drive, program files, no, it's not the C drive, any right, program files. So you can associate it to any .exe program, 
right? So any dot exe program you could put in there, and whenever that program starts, it will initiate the profile. Okay, so we're just going to say that maybe you have a default profile, which is you know this primary profile, which is what it loads up with all the time, whatever, right? And then when you go into another program, you want it to have a different profile because you want to put in macros where when you press the one button, it does a sequence of commands instead of just a remapping or something, right? So you can't be going through Windows where it's doing you know Shift F w e space blah 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 right because then it's just going to start doing random shit all over the place so you're going to associate the profile to a program right um, for the sake of things being easy we're just going to have the one profile that we're going to deal with um, that is going to be the same functions no matter what game or program you're in right it's just going to be the way that it is all the time all right so um, so we have add profile, right? And then there's the whole hardware software thing, right? Um, now one really cool thing that this has is after you create a profile, um, you can import it and export it and send it to a friend, right? So if you build a profile, you can export it. Uh, you can pick the profile that you want to export. You hit export. You pick a place to save it. Boom! You got a, you know, CUE profile that you can send to your friends and they can use it or if you, vice versa you like yo I got this really good idea I built this profile blah 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 take a look at it he looks at it and goes oh well here this macro isn't right so he can adjust it and send it back to you um, and then you can you know have it the way that you like it you know it's a little help from your friends right so it's a really nice little option um, and then there is this download custom profile so it's a really great idea I really like the way that they have this, right? They have, unfortunately, only two devices that it works with right now that I've been able to find out, right? Um, and I know if you go online, there is, I think, five or six devices that it works with. But I just don't know if they just haven't um, put them up. Let me see. Yeah, it's still only two things, right? So, um, so I think there's like five or six devices that it works with, but the Scimitar Pro is not one of them. So we just completely feel taken out of the mix on that. But it's like I say, it's a really cool option, right? And then this is delete. Um, so right, like you have a profile, you don't like it, you delete it. It asks you if you want to delete it, you delete it, and then you got that, right? So right now we only have the default profile. So this is how you would see if you just bought this mouse and you just load up Corsair Utility Engine for the first time, this is what you're gonna see, all right? So these are the profiles. So the profile's pretty cool. Um, so let's see, so CUE. Um, okay, so let's get into the meat and potatoes, the actions. This is what allows you to do what it is that you came here to do, right? This is really the, the purpose for being here. All right, so just to give you an understanding of the flow of how programming works in Utility Engine, um, you have an action. You want to create an action. After you have that action created, you can assign that action to a button. Right? And this is the, the basic, basic way of doing it. Right? So why don't we create an action? So we're going to do create action. So these are the different icons, copy action, save to library, which would be if you have an action that you want to keep reproducing and using it in every type of profile you do or whatever, uh, or just have a fast way of doing it because it's like a macro that's got a, a bunch of different commands built into it. You can create an action and then put it in a library. But for the sake of what we're doing, uh, we don't need to do that. Right? So we're going to create an action. Now, when you first create an action, it always starts off like this. And so this is your, your, your work board or whatever, like the way you change all your your functions and macros and acro, um, actions is all on this side of the map over here, right? So they give you lots of different things to do here. Right? We have macros, we got text. Um, you can, you know, have it print out a book for you every time you hit one, <laughs> you know, whatever, random stuff, right? Um, this is usually what we're here for, is the remap of the key. This is what allows you to take a button and turn it into another button. Uh, media is just that, it's media functions, play, pause, stop, volume up, down, mute, whatever. Um, you can have it launch things, right? Web browsers, email, 
you know, any of this kind of stuff, or just a program if you, you know, have a program that you want to just have it open every time you hit a button. Here's the place that you could do it. All right, there's timers. Uh, you can start a timer for an action or create something for a certain period of time. Um, not exactly sure how this works into the entire thing, but whatever, it's there. I never use it or whatever. Um, I have no clue what this is, why you would want a disable action, but I'm sure they have it there for a reason. And then profile switching, which is obviously this button right here for. Um, so you can have buttons jump to profiles, right? So if you wanted to make it where you had a profile that had a slow DPI, or if you had a profile that um, had different macros into it, if you have like a profile for, I don't know, riding, right? Like flying and riding, and then you have one for fighting, and then, right? I mean, this is going a little bit above and beyond, but I'm just throwing stuff out there, right? Um, but for the sake of what we're doing right now, for this basic, we're just doing remap, all right? So we have a remap, it says remap key one, and we see all the different types of settings that we have for remapping. We have a typing key, a mouse button, or a keystroke. Keystroke is um, just just literally that, just a keystroke. Um, it's not multiple keystrokes, it's a single keystroke. It's um, together, like um, one thing that you do from start to finish can be as many buttons, but it's all about right something and something or uh, really just a keystroke right a typing key is just that any kind of typing key a to z numbers and symbols function keys modifiers whatever right the, what you it's giving you the ability to create any action that you could do but automate it Right, so I mean, it can go pretty far as far as what you want to do, but we're really just trying to do simple things, right? Mouse buttons, all the different mouse buttons, optional mouse buttons right here, um, different ways of doing um, the action, right? Uh, you can have it so it holds it. It can be, um, you know, holding it when you press it, or it toggles it on and off. So when you t press it one time, it turns it off. When you press it again, it turns it turns it on, or vice versa, right? Um, okay, so what we want to do is we want to remap, right? So we have 14 buttons that we have to deal with, 12 here and these two here, right? Everything else is relatively generic and the way that the default um, settings are for it works, right? So you have these 12 buttons and then we have these five buttons and that's all the buttons you have in total, right? So you got whatever that is. 7, 18 buttons or whatever it is, right? So, um, we're concerned about 14 of them. So we have one map here, so the easiest thing to do is to just keep copying that, right? So 13 times or whatever, right? So 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, alright. Now what I like to do is, so we know we have 14 of them, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to start here at 1. Now, this is how you edit the title is in this area right here, right? So then we're going to go to three. Now there's no saving in this either. Um, as you change it, it saves it, right? It's instantaneously. There's no, um, no need to look for a save button. Like I did for 15 minutes when I first started this, driving myself nuts. Um, so once you do it, it saves it. And then we're going to change these, right? So we have four and five, because these are actually the two buttons that we're going to change, right? So we're going to go remap, control V, remap of button four. five right so we're going to remap button four button five and then remap one through twelve so that's everything all right so then now we have to do is tell these buttons what they need to do all right we need them to actually have perform a function because right now they all just say uh they're all a 
right? You see how it's all of them, and they all say A, right? So let's go to one. <clears throat> and what we're trying to do is, what I like to do at least, is, so we have 12 buttons here, which is essentially the num numerical pad, the right-hand side numerical pad, the ASCII pad. Um, so considering your mouse is in your right hand, and the numerical pad is on the right side of the, of the keyboard, you're never, ever, ever going to be pressing um, those buttons when you have your hand on your mouse, right? So if you can take these buttons and put them on your mouse so you can use them now as part of your daily buttons without removing the ability of pressing these buttons, you're up a lot, right? You got like, you're up 12, 14 buttons, which is amazing, right? So let's do that. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into here and it's a typing key, but it's a numeric keypad key, right? So we go to numeric keypad key and then it's remap key one, so let's just make it keypad one, right? Let's get back. So anyway, all right, so we're on 11. All right, so 11 and 12, right? So I know on the Naga, the way that Razor does it, their default 11 and 12 are negative and positive, right? So 11 is negative, 12 is positive. So, and like I say, the reason why I do this is because I have a Naga. Say my Naga broke, and I want to go to a Corsair, but I don't want to do anything. I don't want to change any ca anything in my game because everything you do on the peripheral end needs to remain consistent on the game, on the program that's going to use it. So if you go in and you try to use the Corsair uh, mouse after you have a Naga or whatever, a Logitech, whatever it is, um, you need to go in and make it the same so this way the game interprets the keystrokes that you're giving to the same as it used to be. All right? Otherwise you have to go into the game and then change your key bindings in the game to match with what you have in the program. All right? So all right. So then now we have those 12 keys and then we have these two at the top that we need to deal with, right? Now as far as I know all the mice that I've ever had that have had two buttons up here, they both do the same thing. Forward, back, right? If you're in an Internet Explorer, this goes to the page forward. This one goes to the page back. Um, and the way we can see that this is actually a thing is if you go in here and then we make this a mouse button, and we see all the different op options we have for mouse buttons here, right? Left, right, so left and right button, middle mouse button, right? Middle mouse button back button, it's not there, forward button, it's not there, scroll up, scroll down, right, that's the wheels, tilt left, tilt right, that's the wheel, and that's not generic, that is 100% specific to gaming mice, right, DPI up and down, which currently, um, we don't have a DPI up and down, but we have a toggle DPI, meaning it's next DPI, next DPI, next DPI, and currently that's set for button 5, which this is button 5, this is button 4, right? Um, and then left double click, so you can actually have it where a button can do a double tap for you, right? Opening a screen or something like that, so this way you don't actually have to put into it a macro of you clicking the button twice. So, but what we're trying to do is just make it generic, right? So we have button 4, which is this button which is usually forward, so we're going to make forward. We have button 5, which is this button, which is usually back. All right, so we're going to make this mouse button back. All right. Now we have all of our key bindings for all the buttons, all the, not the key bindings, the functions for all the buttons that we want to associate now. Right. So now we need to tell these functions which button that they need to be attached to. All right. So you go to here, you highlight this, and after you highlight that, click a button. Right? So I like to do it all on this map right here. So these are the three different views of the, mi the mouse that you can use. Um, and the reason why they give you this view uh, isn't really for anything except so you can see the lighting of this and this. Right? So uh, right now all my lighting is turned off so it doesn't do anything. So anyway, so we go here, remap key one, boom. Now you see we have this little yellow line. We have a little uh, yellow triangle at the top of the, the button icon. The, that means that it currently is remapped to something different. And then the remapping goes to this button. Right? And we can validate that this 
function is now mapped to this G1 button. Right? So then we just got to continue this for everything. So 2, 2, 11, 12. All right, and then we're going to go to this view. Remap button 4. Bap. Remap button 5. Bap. Okay. So now we have all of our buttons remapped. All right? So now like I was saying before, there's no saving. It's all on the fly, real time. So what I like to do is to test it to make sure that it's working appropriately is I open up WordPad. Right? And with WordPad, and this is for everything that is a typing button. Right? So if it's going to do a function or something, like if you have a macro where it's going to open a window or do something or whatever, then not clearly this isn't going to work for you. But if you are re-key mapping a button to be another button that types, this is how we do it. So you just go in here, and I'm pressing button 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, back. Oh, look at that. Did not work. Right? No positive came out. And then when I look at this, I see that there is no mapping for button 12. So we go over here, we hit button 12, come over here, and we know we want to associate button 12. And then we come back over here and we go, all right, button 12, positive. Good. We're golden, right? So we know that all of our mapping is reworked. Now, say we want to test the forward and back, right? So I was explaining before that it is. In an Explorer or Google Chrome or whatever it is that you have, it's the forward back button, right? So we do that and then we can test it. Back, forward, back, forward, back, forward. So we know it's working, right? So there we go. We have created a function, we've associated that function with a button, and we have tested the function and its association, right? Beautiful thing. So that's the basics, right? So that's like 101 re key mapping. Now, one thing I would like to get into, um, just because it's kind of cool, um, is macros. Now, it's not going to be a in-depth macro, but it's going to be a simple little understanding of how macros work, right? So we have this macro, you create a new action, right? So we're in the action thing, we create a new action, hit this macro. Macro is the first option that it gives you, right? Now there's two different ways to create a macro. There's recording a way that you, um, recording the keystrokes that you do as it happens, when it happens, and it will reproduce it exactly the way that you did it, right? Which is good, um, but honestly, the reason for using macros is because you don't want to be good. You want to be perfect. Not good, perfect. You can be good already without the macro, right? But if you want to be perfect, you use the macro. And by that, I mean um, there are a certain amount of actions that are allowed, right, in a game. Where if, like, you're playing a game and it sees 50 actions in a second, it bugs out. It doesn't like it. It stops accepting actions for a certain period of time, right? So what we can do is we can create a macro that will reproduce uh, a sequence of buttons or events or actions within a period of time that the program allows for it to receive inputs. Meaning that it won't lock you out from doing things, but you'll still get it done unnaturally fast and accepted, right? So what I like to do is if I want to record a set of button presses, I do it without the delays and then I'll add the delays into it because the delays is what allows you to maintain that button structure, right? That key press actions per second, um, right? So when we're going to record, we're going to record a keyboard event because I'm going to be pushing keys on the buttons, uh, pushing buttons on the keyboard, and I'm going to be clicking mouses, mouse buttons, right? Now, mouse button clicks. Now it gets interpreted as the one, two, three, four, five, six, right? All the things that I did, um, right? So that's why we're doing that. And then keyboard events are just that, my like actual keyboard events, right? So you press, right, things, and it, those things, right? So there we go, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to create, we're going to record um, a sequence of buttons that I want to it to reproduce every time I press it when I'm in the game, right? Uh, so 
going to record. It's not recording delays, so I can take as much time as I want, right? Uh, but it's recording uh, keyboard events and mouse clicks, right? So if I'm playing the game and I want to press, I don't know, on the mouse one, two, three, four, and then five, three, G, E, right? Stop. Okay. Now, let's associate. We just did that, right? No delays, no nothing. But let's associate that what macro that we just made to button one, just to just to see what's going on, right? So it's highlighted button one. So now we see macro is associated to button one. We see button one is just, is remapped because of the little triangle, right? And then let's just open up WordPad. Ready to go? and see what it does, right? So now I'm going to hit button one, and it just did everything that we just did before, right? One, two, three, four, five, G, right? All at one time. It literally gave us all of that information instantaneously, right? One command. Now, if you're playing a game, that's not going to work, right? If you're going to play a game, you might get one, two, and then after that, three, four, five, maybe it'll come back for G and E. I don't know. I doubt it, but it's, you're probably just going to get like one, two done, and then all this is just going to disappear. It's just not going to accept it at all as, a, as an input, right? So that's fail. So what we can do is go in here, and we can add the delays where we want them, so this way it interprets it appropriately, right? So you see how it says press key one, release key one, press key two, release key two, press key one, right? Now sometimes if you want to do things, um, you need it to do two things together, right? Like you want it to press shift one and then release one and release shift, right? So that's actually you're pressing two buttons at the same time. So that gets a little more complicated, but we're going to get into that real quick, all right? First things first, we want to add delays in between these button presses so it doesn't see each one as a thing, right? So right here, we're going to insert new event but we're going to be on the last event that we're trying to deal with because it's going to edit behind it right so you see it's one two three and then there's a pause event delay and we this is by milliseconds right so a thousand milliseconds is one second so if you put in a thousand oh done there you go silly me there is a save button for that so anyway so then you come in here and you push the button see it goes one Two, three, four, 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 whatever, right? So you see that delay? That delay was one second long. Now, one second is a really long time, right? We don't want one second, right? What we really want, from what I have found, at least in games, is we're looking for about three tenths of a second, right? 300 milliseconds worth of delay. So what we want to do is come over here and we want to edit this, right? Edit selected event, the selected event, it's highlighted yellow, edit, and now, we want is 300 done All right now what we can do is copy this and then every single release of key is we want to paste this 300 okay All right so then now we have a 300 millisecond delay between everything Four, five, six, seven, boom, 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 right? So that's awesome, right? There you go, bang. So it just does that entire macro. Okay, so that's it's an interesting little sequence of buttons that you can put together. Now, um, a lot of the times, so for the games, I should, I should say, the game, like, wow, it just doesn't necessarily really come into very usefulness. It, it can, don't get me wrong, it can. But honestly, you should be able to just push the buttons at the way that you want, and you're going to get the result that you want, right? Uh, but certain things like um, Black Desert Online, where you have a sequence of buttons that you need to press in order for it to work appropriately, and you need those button presses to be spaced out very precisely so you can get the most amount of actions per second, actions per minute, um, that the game will allow this is where you're going to want to do it, right? So we're just going to say, all right, let's do it.
do a new macro. Alright, macro do. Alright, macro. Alright, and instead of recording what we want to do, because we know exactly what we want to do, right, we're going to create it just by telling it what to do, right? So we're going to do a keyboard event. We have a keystroke, key press, key release, or keystroke, right? Keystroke is an entire stroke, meaning start to finish, meaning a press and release, right? If you're trying to do things like two buttons together, you need to do it by the key press, key release, not a keystroke, right? So as an example, we're going to go key press, Now this is slow, don't get me wrong. Right? We want left shift, where is it? Left shift, right? Done. And then we want to add another event. And you see how it puts it below it, right? And you see how it's red because it's saying that you're holding it down right now. What do you want me to do because this is not a, a complete command, right? And you're like, all right, don't worry about it. Just shut the fuck up and let me finish what I got to do, and we'll be good, right? So then we're going to go keyboard event, and we're going to go key press again, and we want it to be F, right? Done. So now we have, we're holding down left shift, and we're pressing left uh, F, right? So now what we want to do is add another event, right? And we want to add a keyboard event. Right? And what we want to do is a key release. And this key release is going to be the left shift. Right? Which is going to be someplace around here. Left shift. Done. Right? And you see how it's not red anymore. So it's a complete keystroke. It's happy with it. It's not holding anything down. It's not doing anything weird. Right? So then we're going to add another event. And this one's going to be a keyboard event. And it's going to be a key release. And we're going to go for the F. Boom. Right? Done. Now, that is one sequence of keys. Right? Now, black does it online. That's a move, right? Shift F is a move. Now, if you wanted to go into your flow, you would want to do, you want to add a delay. We want it to be 300 millisecond delay, right? And then we want to add more events. Now, say the next event was just a standard key press, like um, so. You shift F was the first part of your flow, and then we're going to say that Q is the next part of your flow, right? So we're going to go keyboard event. We want it to be a full keystroke because it's a start to finish event. And Q. Done. All right? So now let's test this. Oh, actually, first we got associate, right? So we're going to go macro 2, click 1, right? G1, G1, macro 1 is no longer key bound, and re uh, map, remap key 1 is no longer bound, right? So we know when we press 1 that this is going to give us whatever the macro is that we just did. So we press it, capital F, Q, capital F, Q, right? So say you want to validate and you make sure that it's going to work. Right? Even though it's working on the, the word pad, so you want to see what's going on, right? So you open the on-screen keyboard, you press the button, and when you do that, it shows you what you just did. See that? I mean, it's really fast, don't get me wrong. But, right? FQ, 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 right? So you see how we validated that, right? So then now, every time you press the one button, it's going to go Shift FQ. Right? So if you're playing in a game where that's a deal because you constantly, every time you press Shift F, that move, whatever that is, you always press the other one after that. And if the other one after that isn't available, it's just not going to work. And it's just going to, next time you press the button, it's going to press the same deal, Shift F and then Q. Right? 
So there you go. That's that's macro simply done showing you how to associate it to a button. Uh, if anybody wants more of an in-depth um, ar uh, article or whatever VOD on the different types of macros and how you would put them in there and different ways to sequence them and things like that, just throw it a little comment um, and I'll work on it for you. All right. All right. So that's pretty much everything that you really need to know about um, actions. All right. So you can understand the flow of how you want to create a function, and then after you create the function, you want to associate it to a button, uh, and then that's pretty much it, right? There's different, many different types of functions that you can do, um, and just associating it to a button, call it a day, right? So that's that's the basics of this, real simple, for any device that they have. All right, so let's get in, let's get into the lighting effects. Like I said, I don't want to take a, a lot of time with this because it's not in my mind. It's not all that important. You know, it's it's nice to have the lighting change and do all types of cool things for you, right? Because you enjoy it. But let's face it, it does jack shit for you, right? So, but let's do this. Let's create an effect. Now, the thing I want you to understand about lighting is that this light right here has nothing to do with your lighting effect, really that lighting all comes from DPI settings. Right? This is really what affects that. All right. So as you change this, this is what is going to affect what that thing looks like. And I mean, you can't see it right now, but whatever. It's changing it for me. Anyway, so let's get into, stati um, into lighting. So there's a couple different types of lighting. There's static, gradient, and solid. Um, honestly, I don't even know what solid, the reason why you would have solid, but I feel like it's just changing colors per a time model. Gradient allows you to change the color and the, um, the fuck is it called? Uh, intensity of it, right, how bright or how, li how light or bright it is. And then static is just consistent, just one color, no matter what, that's the end of it. No big deal, right? So you have four different zones, fun zone, scroll zone, side zone, logo zone, right? Logo, uh, hold on, front, which is this lighting here, scroll, which is this lighting here, side, oh, which is this lighting here, which I guess the deep, maybe that overrides the DPI colors. That's probably what goes on. You could probably override the DPI color. And then the logo zone, which is back here. All right. So we're not going to do a static. We're going to do a gradient. And everyone that's highlighted here gets affected by this right here. So if you want to do different gradients for different zones, you got to create different lighting effects and apply it to that zone. Um, for as, a, as an example, right, we're just going to say, I don't want to do the logo zone. I want to do the front zone, the scroll zone and not the side zone, right? Because I want my side zone to be my DPI settings. So that, or how I know what DPI setting I'm in through the color that comes through on the side, right? So we have front zone, scroll zone. So I want them to be gradient. I want them to start off as red, add, right? So you see how that changed color, right? And then I want to make it after so it's 10 seconds, it's 10 lines, so after one and a half seconds, I want it to get half as bright. That's not really showing anything. All right, so maybe it just sucks at showing brightness. Anyway. It does not show the brightness very well in the thing, but whatever, it is what it is. So anyway, <coughs> one and a half seconds, I want to get half is bright and red, right? It's kind of like a fade a little bit. And then at three seconds, I want it to be completely same 100% brightness, but I want it to turn to purple, right? And then second and a half into it, half is bright, I want it to stay purple, 
but just get less brighter. But then I want it to turn to blue. All right. So you see how it grades. Right, and then we want to add another one, and I want my blue to get half as bright. I want to change my timing a little bit. All right. And I want it to get dim. And then I want it to get really bright again. Not that much time. There we go. Boom. I want it to go green. Uh, yeah, green. Add event. And then I want this one to just completely just fade out and go to yellow. Bang. All right. So there you go. So now if you looked at your mouse, you would see it is changing exactly like it is. All right. So as you see it on the screen is exactly how you see it on your mouse at that current time. So my mouse right now is cycling between intensity and color for 10 seconds, which you can change. You can make this five seconds, and then it's real fast. Boom, boom pulsing. Right? You can make it 25 seconds. Whoa, 0 0.1 second. That's kind of crazy, right? 25 seconds. So now, it's real slow. You can watch it happen real slow, just doing its thing. Alright, All right, so that's lighting. DPI. Now, DPI dots per inch means how many dots every inch that the mouse moves over how many dots on the screen is it going to go over? So right now, the way I have it set up is every inch has 2,000 separate dots built into it, right? If my screen is 1920 by 1080, it means that pretty much one inch of movement brings me across the entire screen. And if I wanted it to be exactly like it, I literally would just come in here and just go 1920. So every inch of movement I do equals to an entire screen. All right? That makes sense? So if you wanted to double that where every inch went two screens or every half inch equaled a screen, you would just double 1920 and whatever the hell that is, like 36 something, I don't know, 40 or, I don't know, yeah, 36, 40 or something. Right now, every half inch brings me an entire screen. Bap, bap, right, so that's how that works. All right, personally, I just keep it at 2K. So anyway, all right. Now there are six different possibilities of DPI settings that you can do here. All right, um, you can have. Any one active, and you see how that works. Whichever one active, the on off switch removes itself from it and it goes to that setting, that 800 dpi setting. All right. All right, so if these are on, you have to actually have a button to switch through the dpi in order for this to change. All right, so this is just telling you which one it's going to default to until you change it. Default, right? But you have to actually have a button that switches through it all. And when you do that, it's going to change the color of whatever this is right here. Like, see how it's 800 and I'm really, really slow, right? So say I wanted to go to this 9,000 one, right? I click it on, it becomes my default one. I turn that off. Whoa. Now you see how fast it all is, right? And you see how this went blue, right? So you know you're on this 9,000 DPI setting. Wow, this is crazy. I need to turn this off. <laughs> Go back to my normal 2000. Yeah, oh my god, I can't click anything. Default. Turn you off. Oh, okay, back to normal, right? So there you go. So that's just the DPI. It's there to tell you what DPI setting you're on as far as that color is considered, provided that you don't have a lighting effect overriding it in here, right? Um, yeah, so that's it. Performance, I honestly have no clue what goes on here. Uh, I've never found the reason to do it, or everything has worked fine without adjusting any of this, right? No, so no big deal. 
surface calibration. It's um, it's a good little thing to have, depending on the type of surface you have. Like you know, I have a mouse pad, and the mouse pads are really, really good reflective surfaces, and the lasers work really well. And I don't get any jumps or skips or anything like that. So most of the time, calibrating um, is not necessary. Right, but if you're on a desk and maybe your desk got like some texture to it or something's not quite right and you'll notice that every once in a while your mouse when you're just going up and it should be going nice and smooth it actually like wobbles back and forth or goes up and back up and back up and back it's probably because of the texture that's on underneath the mouse so what you can do is you can come into here and you see this speed bar you need to keep spinning this thing until that green the needle is in the green right so you see how that works and then you're done you calibrate it yay and you can just keep doing it if you want right bigger circles you're just trying to keep it in the green for the period of time that they want you and that's it and then it's calibrated so that's uh... i think that's everything hope you guys were able to make use of this um, that it was ex extensive enough to the point where you got a really good idea on the Corsair uh, utility engine and how to program for it um, if you guys need anything else as far as programming in here is considered, maybe profiles, why you would set up different profiles, um, the way to set it up for different types of games or in the same game but have multiple profiles, anything like that or anything you're trying to achieve, some kind of effect that you're trying to make happen, you can throw it in the comments and I'll try to comment about it or make a video for it. All right, Thanks guys.